Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started. Let's talk some science today about heart health. I'm going to get into some details on cardiovascular disease. This is so common and affects so many people throughout this country. And many times people will have the question of, should I be taking certain supplements? Would that be beneficial? What should I be doing in terms of diet and exercise? And obviously there's going to be variables from one person to the next, but there are some basic guidelines that I can clue you into that may be advantageous for you to consider. So my name is Amanda Williams. I am an MD, MPH. So we are going to get into the heart of the heart today. So let's just get right to it and talk about why it is that cardiovascular disease is such a problem here in the United States. We know when we're looking at coronary artery disease, when we think about atherosclerosis, for example, this affects upwards of 16 million Americans. It's actually probably quite greater than that. But being that a lot of people don't go in for regular physical examinations and perhaps um, are walking around with undiagnosed heart disease, this is why that number is probably quite uh, low based on what we know when it comes to the health of the average American. Now, when we recognized that cardiovascular disease was very much so talked about, but in the same sense, not well explained to the average person. I started to to look at much of the research and realized that so much of the research when it comes to heart health is very grounded in heavy science. And when you start to talk a lot of the specifics on cardiovascular disease, you start to lose a lot of people. So I want to try and make it a little bit more simple and talk about, you know, many of the risk factors that we definitely know about when it comes to cardiovascular disease. First and foremost, we can look at diet. We know that following a standard American diet is going to be lacking and key things like fiber, most importantly, the average American's getting roughly five to 10 grams of fiber per day when it is required that we be getting at minimum 30 grams of fiber per day. And we know that Americans are just not achieving that. Now, the other thing that we can look at is the lack of antioxidant in the diet. And the reason why we have a lack of antioxidants is because you can see that Americans do not have a high intake when it comes to fruit and vegetable consumption. So your fruits and vegetables are going to be your primary sources of those powerful antioxidants that help to protect all of the cells that line your blood vessels, for example. So being that we know these things and we look at the different risk factors and we look at elevated cholesterol as being a potential risk factor, we look at um, high blood pressure clearly as a risk factor. But the one area that we usually don't spend enough focus on is inflammation. And it's that chronic low-grade inflammation that's occurring throughout the vascular system that is the main driving force. But yet they don't talk about that. When we talk about inflammation as a general term, most people think of taking an NSAID, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And people will take that for a variety of different reasons. Perhaps they have arthritis, perhaps they have a headache, a lot of different reasons as to why people use utilize NSAIDs. Well, we know one thing about NSAIDs is that the long-term chronic use of NSAIDs is not a good idea, being that it can have negative effects when it comes to liver health, when it comes to kidney health. So turning to NSAIDs for a chronic condition is definitely not the best choice. Using an NSAID in a short-term setting for an acute condition, that's a different story. So if you're using, you know, one ibuprofen, you know, a couple of times out of the year. That's one thing. But there are people who are popping these NSAIDs on a 
regular basis every single day. So we have to just look at things such as inflammation. What's the one thing that we know drives up inflammation in the body more than anything else is our foods. So if people are following a standard American diet, which is lacking in fiber and high in sugar, then we are going to be walking around in a pro-inflammatory state, which can then lead to inflammation throughout the entire body, but also when we think about the cardiovascular system. So that's the main issue that is oftentimes not even addressed. We can look at issues with elevated glucose and insulin levels and understanding that when someone is a diabetic, they are at a greater risk. If someone has a has metabolic syndrome, for example, they are at a greater risk for the development of cardiovascular disease because we're doing continual damage via glycation to the endothelial cells. That's what lines those blood vessels. We can look at hormonal imbalances. We certainly can link hormonal fluctuations to the onset and exacerbation of cardiovascular disease. We can look at obesity, and we know that obesity is running rampant throughout this country. So these are all things that we have to be cognizant of. So where's the first place that people can start when we're talking about heart healthy? And heart healthy isn't, oh, I'm gonna have you know a bowl of oatmeal once a week and call it good. Unfortunately, most doctors do not have the first clue when it comes to diet. And obviously when it comes to supplements, we know that. But when it comes to diet, they'll say, well, just eat a well-balanced diet. Well, what does that mean? A well-balanced diet. If you tell the average person, eat a well-balanced, healthy diet, they may say, okay, well, that's, you know, maybe I'll have one salad a week and I'll have a bowl of oatmeal. And that certainly does not lead us down the path to a heart healthy diet. So we have to incorporate that Mediterranean style diet where we have a high abundance of fruits and vegetables every day, where we have good healthy fats. We need to obtain those omega-3 fatty acids from the diet. So eating fatty fish, things such as salmon, for example, very, very beneficial. So we know all these things. We know that exercise is important. If we're going to be couch potatoes, we're going to end up paying the price for that. There is no way around that. And you cannot consider sitting there with your remote control and doing thumb exercises by flipping the channel up and down in the volume up and down as your exercise for the day. You have to move. And it doesn't mean that you have to go out and say, You know, I've never exercised in my life, but I'm going to go, you know, become a marathon runner. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is just the physical activity of moving. So even for those who have limited mobility because of maybe severe arthritis or another condition, you can still find ways to stay on a physical active routine that will benefit your heart and your brain and your skeletal muscles. And that is what the goal is at the end of the day. So we have diet, we have exercise, and you have to do these two things. There's no way to avoid them. So you have to make those dietary changes. And I've had so many people say, well, this is the way I've ate my whole life. I'm 75 years old. What difference does it make? Now, it makes a huge difference It can make a huge difference in your life. It can make a huge difference in your energy, how you feel every single day. For many people, they start going out and they start maybe even walking around the block a couple of times. And they say, you know, I actually feel like I have more energy. Well, yeah, because we're now getting proper blood flow, proper oxygenation out to those tissues. But we also need to be cognizant that we have to replenish as we get older. So we have to think about different supplements that we can be utilizing that can be beneficial when it comes to cardiovascular health. And we think about things like omega-3 fatty acids, so taking something like fish oil or krill oil. We think about things such as ubiquinol, coenzyme Q10, and helping to support the proper production of ATP at that mitochondrial level. Remember your mitochondria is the energy powerhouse of the cell. And the areas that have the highest energy output in the body have the highest demand for coenzyme Q10. So we look at those two areas and we look at the heart and we look at the brain. 
if we do not have adequate coenzyme Q10, those areas are going to struggle in terms of energy production. Now, this is an area that I love to talk to people about, especially people who have, you know, maybe been seeing a cardiologist for many years. I always say, have you had your CoQ10 level tested? And they just look, no, I didn't know I could get that tested. That is huge. You need to have your coenzyme Q10 level tested because many doctors, even cardiologists will tell you, eh, CoQ10, it's not important. Just made up by the supplement world. They just want to sell bottles of product. CoQ10 exists in the human body. You can have a serum blood test done to see what your CoQ10 level is. And I worked with a gentleman one time, had a history of cardiovascular disease, had a bypass surgery, had hypertension, had elevated cholesterol, was on multiple drugs, and he was seeing his cardiologist on a regular basis to make sure everything was going smooth according to the cardiology guidelines. But yet this cardiologist would test a CBC, so a complete blood count, do a lipid panel, so looking at his total cholesterol, and then do a liver enzyme test because they had him on a statin drug. But never did they look for markers for systemic inflammation, things such as high sensitivity C-reactive protein, looking for vascular inflammation markers such as homocysteine, or looked for their CoQ10 levels. So I said to him, you know, the next time you go back in and you see your cardiologist, ask for that CoQ10 test. Even if he looks at you like you're from outer space, just ask for that. Because it's very important because not only do you have a major history of cardiovascular disease, you're also on a statin drug, which we know can lower your body's ability to properly manufacture coenzyme Q10. So he did. He went into his doctor and his doctor reluctantly ordered the coenzyme Q10 test for him. So come to find out, not a surprise to me, but to him, his CoQ10 levels were down in the dumps and he was not supplementing with CoQ10. So we got him on a routine, said, okay, you need to start taking coenzyme Q10 every single day on a regular basis, but not just the ubiquinone form. Standard supplementation of coenzyme Q10 generally comes in the form of ubiquinone. You need to make sure you were taking ubiquinol, ending in OL. This is the reduced antioxidant form. This is the form that is going to absorb much more readily into your system and help the body enhance that mitochondrial energy production. So he did. And then about six months later, went back into his doctor, back to the cardiologist. They retested his CoQ10. His level went up and he was finding that he felt better, which is always very good. And it makes sense because if your cells are starving for energy and you replenish that energy, well, then one would make the assumption that you're going to feel better. And certainly in his situation, he found that to be the case. So we look at just these basic things. We look at the important and significant role that the omega-3 fatty acids play. We look at the role that ubiquinol coenzyme Q10 plays. We look at B vitamins, things like niacin, or in the reduced form NADH. We look at how beneficial that is when it comes to endothelial function in helping the body support the cardiovascular system much more efficiently. But we cannot overlook the role of things such as magnesium. If we have magnesium deficiency, we're going to experience more vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction is not a good thing, especially in the setting of someone who already has hypertension. Now, here's the roundabout odd thing is that many of the cardiovascular drugs that are prescribed for hypertension have the finite ability of creating a really unwanted side effect, which includes lowering your magnesium levels. So you'll have someone who goes in and is told by their physician, hey, you have high blood pressure. We need to put you on a medication. They start them off with one. They go back in. The pressure's still high. They say, oh, we got to add another drug. And then oftentimes they go back in they have to add a third drug. That is irresponsible medicine. Because if you're not also telling that person, hey, you need to also be supplementing with magnesium, because these drugs that you're taking can lower your magnesium. The lower the magnesium, the more likely for vasoconstriction. So you're taking a strong pharmacological agent, which is trying to help keep those vessels open 
And then at the same time, that same pharmacological agent is depleting your magnesium, which is causing natural vasoconstriction. So there's so many different components to it, but it's not rocket science. This is not difficult. And unfortunately, because of that lack of proper information that is delivered to cardiovascular patients, they walk around for years not knowing, like, hey, I need to change my diet. Not just the old DASH diet of let me just avoid salt and make sure I don't have a high intake of sodium. You have to think beyond that. You have to understand that antioxidants matter and healthy fats matter and fiber matters. And you have to also recognize that omega-3 fatty acids, which are completely deficient in the American diet, are so needed for proper cardiovascular function. In the absence of adequate omega-3 fatty acids, we're going to have issues with maintaining healthy cholesterol, maintaining healthy blood pressure, maintaining endothelial function within those vessels, as well as just think about brain health. The brain is made up of fat. If we are not obtaining good, healthy fats from the diet, then what do you think is happening to the brain? It starts to atrophy. And they've done studies where they've been able to show that. People who adhere to a Mediterranean diet, they do MRI imaging, you see a nice full brain. You have someone who follows a standard American diet, you start to see the shrinking brain. Not a good idea. If it's doing that to the brain, what is it doing to the rest of the body? This is why omega-3 fatty acids are so key. So I've mentioned things like fish oil and krill oil. You can go to our website and you can check those out. You know, when they do studies of omega-3 content in the body, which is another thing that you can have tested. So say you do a fatty acid profile. The ratio that is ideal is two to one. So two omega-6 for every one omega-3 in terms of what we want to see on a blood test. Did you know that the average American, that level comes back at 20 to one? So 20 omega-6 for every one omega-3. And what we know about omega-6 fatty acids is that this can create a situation where if we have an overabundance of them, it can work more as a pro-inflammatory fat, which is not a good thing. So, you know, you're defeating the purpose once again, if we are not getting adequate omega-3 fatty acids coming from dietary intake or from supplementation. And we just have to be honest about it. We know that diet is not going to yield enough um, to offset the omega-6s. So supplementation is certainly warranted, but you have to look at all of the different factors and all of the different ways by which you can help to really optimize your overall cardiovascular health. I mean, you have to think about maintaining a healthy inflammatory response. So this comes from yielding things that we know help to keep inflammation at bay. We have to think about where the majority of our immune system, where a lot of those pro-inflammatory cytokines are released from. You have to think about gut health. So, you know, probiotics are very beneficial as well. So there's blood tests that you can do to assess and really determine where you stand when it comes to cardiovascular risk. We can look for those markers for inflammation. We can do hormone testing to see, are we at a greater likelihood for the events that can occur because of a disrupted hormonal system? Looking at things such as DHEA, for example, there was a study where they looked at 2000 men and they found that low levels of DHEA were a direct predictive value when it came to the risk for coronary heart disease. So these are things that are out there. We know that we know that so many factors come into play when we look at hormones, when we look at cardiovascular disease. So it's diet, it's exercise, it's hormones, it's lack of antioxidants, lack of omega-3 fatty acids. All of these things can make a huge difference. Having issues such as low serum vitamin D levels. This is also a potential risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Not getting adequate vitamin K. For goodness sakes, they did a study in Georgia where they looked at the vitamin K intake, dietary intake. So from green leafy vegetables, we're talking K1 here. So they looked at the lack of vitamin K in a group of 
teenagers in Georgia, and then they looked at their cardiovascular health, and they found a really unique correlation between low intake of green leafy vegetables and greater risk for cardiovascular disease, even enlarged hearts. So that's one aspect. We also have to look at vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is very important because this helps calcium find its way to the bones. So calcium's not lingering around in those blood vessels. We definitely don't want to see that. So there's so many different things that we can be doing and assessing and changing to maintain the overall cardiovascular system. You know, being physically active, making sure that we are taking in the right foods every day and making sure that we are supplementing with the right nutrients. So even at bare minimum, we can look at things such as the omega-3 fatty acids, we can look at ubiquinol, CoQ10, we can look at magnesium, we can look at vitamin D, and just for fun, we can throw in some other antioxidants. We can look at some of the powerful polyphenols, such as resveratrol, for example. Also a really good choice. So there's a lot of different ways. We can look at tocotrienols, that's another one I I hate to um, leave that out in the big scheme of things, talking about heart health, because tocotrienols, that form of vitamin E, is really powerful and really beneficial when it comes to making sure that your cholesterol particles, the LDL, the low-density lipoproteins, do not become oxidized. Oxidized LDLs are deadly. And that's another test, by the way, that you can have done. You can go to your doctor and have an oxidized LDL test done. So the more you know about your overall risk, the more modifications you can make to maintain the health of your heart and your entire cardiovascular system. Remember, when you're doing this, when you change the diet, when you're taking the right supplements, when you're exercising, this is helping to support every aspect of of our overall health. So this is just kind of a brief overview of cardiovascular health. I will get into some details about specific ways in which magnesium can be beneficial or tocotrienols can be beneficial. But definitely you can go to our website and you can check out some of the things that I was discussing when it comes to cardiovascular health, talking about the importance of ubiquinol, talking about the importance of NADH and resveratrol, as well as fish oil and krill oil. And that is all that I have for you today, but I definitely want to thank you for tuning in to the Invite Health Podcast. Remember, you can find all of our episodes for free wherever you listen to podcasts or by visiting invitehealth.com slash podcast. Now, make sure that you subscribe and that you leave us a review. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Invite Health, and we will see you next time for another episode of the Invite Health Podcast.